Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Medicine, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Claire Clark. I'm one of the hosts of the channel. And today I'm talking to Michal Raz, the Charles E. and Dale L. Phelps Professor in Public Policy and Health at the University of Rochester, and the author of the recently released book, Abusive Policies, How the American Child Welfare System Lost Its Way, which is just out from the University of North Carolina Press. Michal, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I wonder if you could begin our interview with our sort of standard question by just telling us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I guess I'm a practicing physician. I take care of adults in a hospital. So we call that a hospitalist physician. And I teach history of health policy, which is really a niche field that I'm lucky to have been able to find a job doing exactly what I've trained to do. I did my PhD and my MD in a combined program at Tel Aviv. Um, and then worked in Israel, volunteered at Physicians for Human Rights, and had the good fortune to do a postdoc at Yale, uh, working with Naomi Rogers. Uh, that really helped me solidify my thinking about um, history of movements and history of activism and health. Uh, and then my next steps were moving to the United States, essentially for good, training in internal medicine. Um, at Yale, where I finished a residency in medicine. And then I went on to the University of Pennsylvania to do a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Fellowship. Um, These fellowships are in health policy. And I was fortunate to be accepted to do history of health policy. I had to write a pretty convincing essay why they should take me, but they they were up for it. Um, And I got my training in health policy research at Penn. Uh, Working at Penn, I had the good fortune to work with the, you know, the amazing Dorothy Roberts, who essentially is a pioneer of writing and thinking about mm-hmm. racism and child mm-hmm. welfare. Um, and that's really what informed my thinking about child abuse. And my book on child abuse kind of stemmed from my previous book, uh, also out with UNC Press called What's Wrong with a Poor? which talked about kind of well-intentioned approaches to addressing poverty by trying to essentially fix poor people and talk about what are the psychiatric deficits or the, um, you know, the psychological deficits that, that poor people suffer from and how we can address them rather than focusing on strengths and resilience and building up communities. And the, um, or the role of parents was something that really struck me uh, in, as I was doing my research for that book. And really the war on poverty became, you know, the war on poor people. Um, And one of that remnants was the war on parents or how we think about poor parents and parents of color. And that really from the 1960s war on poverty and, you know, fixing poor people to be better parents, which was my second book. um, The seventies saw the rise of essentially labeling poor parents as bad parents and abusive parents. And that really sparked my interest in child abuse. Uh, And living in Philadelphia at the time when I was doing my fellowship, my husband was in the military. He was in the Navy. And I was living in Philadelphia in a small apartment with my two kids, both, you know, two kids under two and a dog. And the dog would have to go out. So I would leave the kids sleeping in their cribs and their beds and take the dog out and walk around the block. And when I was doing that, I was I realized, you know, how privileged I am living in West Philly to be walking my dog, leaving the kids alone at home for a few minutes, um, and that nobody would call child welfare services on me. But if I were poor or if I were black, you know, I could lose my kids for making this choice. And to me, it seemed like a reasonable choice. It's maybe safer for me to walk the dog around the block with the kids tucked in bed than taking all the kids out with me and walking them in the cold and the dark to not leave them alone. But this was a calculation that I was allowed to choose and make and that other women did not get that privilege to choose, to make decisions about how they parent, what kind of risks they find acceptable, what kind of trade-offs. And that really kind of helped me think about child abuse and what we think about in child abuse. And while I was in Philly, I got involved with a group of women activists uh, in a group called DHS Give Us Our Children Back. Um, And these women really... um, volunteered to help each other and represent women who've lost their kids to uh, the welfare services. 
And listening to their stories, it struck me, you know, the differences between our lives, what choices I could make versus what choices they were not allowed to make. And these experiences really shaped my thinking about child abuse and child welfare interventions. Um, and together with the um, input from my mentors uh, at the time, also Robbie Ar- Arnovitz at Penn, uh, and I, um, I became really interested in trying to use history to think about the current challenges that child welfare system faces. Let's talk a little bit about how this is a medical problem, right? So, so how and when did child abuse come to be defined as a medical problem? And then, um, you know, how, how would we teach medical students and trainees about child abuse, you know, in our undergraduate and graduate medical education? So children have been, you know, mistreated physically and sexually and emotionally in their homes since forever. But child abuse is a relatively new concept. Uh, And it came into being in the 1960s. And there were a bunch of different factors that shaped the moment in which we identified a medical syndrome of child abuse. And these included, you know, the rise of pediatrics as a respectable medical profession, the rise of radiological studies that you could suddenly see fractures that were otherwise obscure. Uh, And generally kind of this belief that there are social problems that we can use government interventions to fix, which was perhaps a somewhat naive approach that prevailed in the 60s. And in the early 60s, the first publication on this symptom of the battered child appeared in 1962 in the Journal of the American Medical Association in JAMA. And that quickly reverberated across the nation with uh, items written in the popular press and so on. Uh, And that article relied on on x-rays to show evidence of past fractures that we hadn't known of. Um, And really with that article, which came at the right time, um, it set into motion this new definition of a medical problem of child abuse. Uh, And that's something to think about, that when we think about child abuse today, when we think about the cases that are called to child protective services, only a very small minority involve physical abuse of children. uh, And a smaller minority, thankfully, involve sexual abuse of children. The vast minority are reports of neglect. And neglect is an amorphous concept that is often confused with poverty. I mean, you know, how do you even define neglect in a country where people don't have uh, access to childcare, access to health, access to housing, access to food? You know, who is being abusive? But these um, gaps in what children need to thrive are often, you know, these gaps are often laid at the foot of parents who are blamed for what they are not providing for their children. So. In many ways, we think about child abuse as a medical problem, and that has a history. But when we look to take a bigger step, we should think about, you know, a system that is not providing for parents and children what they need to thrive. And then what do we teach medical students about this? Do we teach them, I, you know, I think this is part of the argument that your book, do, do we teach them that um, folks that come in that, you know, or children who present in a certain way need to be given resources? Or do we teach something else? So every single state in the United States has a mandated reporting law that requires um, certain individuals or some states, all individuals who suspect child abuse to report it. And these include all medical professionals. And medical students are really trained from the beginning of their medical studies about the value and need to report. So any suspicion you need to report. And it's particularly drilled into medical students that it's not our job as medical professions, it's not our job as medical professionals to investigate these concerns. But if we even think about it, if it even crosses our mind, we should call protective services. And that's a problem because, you know, it implies that protective services are in a better position to evaluate if something is abuse or not than a physician. And in some cases, that's true. And in some cases, it's not. You know, many hospitals have a child abuse team that you could call them and they could decide whether it's appropriate to make a referral or not. Uh, One of my colleagues who's a child abuse physician at Penn would say, you know, it's so frustrating when they call me to, to see a child, but they've already they've already reported it. And to unreport a report, to unring a bell is just impossible. So the the always the um, 
a thinking is think less, report more. And the think less is even kind of uh, something I'm quoting that was in the in the newspapers in the past, because that's really how uh, training in medical schools uh, is approached. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to investigate it. You should report. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about who is required to report and what situations are reportable. And most people err on the side of um, expansive definitions of reporting. So, you know, if, if a kid doesn't follow up with a, an appointment that was made, then the parents could be uh, reported for neglect or medical neglect. So there's a lot of situations that don't necessarily seem like abuse or not abusive, but they get reported anyway, under the impression that Child Protective Services will sort through it. And the truth is, Child Protective Services does not do a good job sorting through it. They're understaffed, under-resourced, high turnover. Individuals there usually have only an undergraduate degree and do not have this ability to investigate in depth. And this it creates this kind of essentially a, pa- a passing of a buck that, you know, it doesn't matter what's going on, I'll just report it and they'll figure it out. But in the end, nobody's actually providing useful, valuable services to families. And we know that most of the reports that come into the system do not end with a provision of new services to families. So your book does a really wonderful job of, of sort of showing how, how we got here. Um, and you open with the book with the discussion of this support group that I had never heard of and up until now, um, uh, you know, up until your, your research called Parents Anonymous. And the group sounds like it would be just a pretty innocuous resource for struggling parents, you know, but um, what, what, the, what you show in the book is that it, this group really significantly influenced the development of child welfare policy. Um, and may, not necessarily, and, and you're a little bit criti- critical of it, right? Like not for the better. So um, t- tell us about this, what this group stood for and what their influence was. Yeah, sure. So Parents Anonymous uh, was um, founded in the early 70s by Jolly Kay. She, she went by a uh, pseudonym. And uh, she was a mother who uh, professed that she had abused her daughter and that she had been abused herself. She was... Um, very dramatic and opening about her struggles, and she was looking for a venue to get help. And together with her uh, psychiatric social worker, they said first it was called Mothers Anonymous and later became Parents Anonymous. And these were groups um, to support parents who abused their children or were worried that they might do so. Uh, And they really kind of swept into prominence when she gave testimony in the in federal hearings about the Child Abuse and Protection Treatment Act. Uh, and this, in these hearings were 1973, the act passed in 1974. Um, and her telling of the story was essentially like a sinner who repented. You know, I was an abuser. I took responsibility on myself. I no longer abuse. Abusers are are people who are suffering, who are sick. They need help. So it really crystallized this idea that child abuse was a mental illness problem and that abusers needed help. And this was in contrast uh, to what was known by researchers in the time of child welfare researchers, that child abuse was closely related to racism and to poverty, that people at homes that, that didn't have telephones and which parents were isolated, had higher rates of abuse, that parents who suffered from racism f- were not able to obtain jobs, uh, joblessness, were not able to find homes because of discrimination. All these were uh, risk factors for abuse. So it's not a story about how poor people or about how certain minorities abuse their children more than others, but rather how these stresses that families experience are risk factors for abuse and also how increased surveillance causes more reports of abuse. Uh, and what uh, this group and Jolly Kay, who was founding this group, did is they w- whitewashed child abuse into a uh, middle class everyday problem and kind of diluted the concept so much that essentially all of us are child abusers and um, all kinds of abuse are equal. Emotional abuse is the same thing as physical or sexual abuse. And that what you need to do is take personal responsibility and um, participate in a support club. And none of this really addressed the root factors of abuse or offered valuable services to families. Um, And it really shaped the um, public discourse and the policymakers discourse on how we should think about child abuse. It was essentially a missed opportunity to intervene at the root causes. Um, And, what was interesting, these groups, they got a lot of federal money because with the passage of CAPTA, there were federal funds available. And essentially, it was a giant grift. 
these people employed themselves. They each group was tiny. There were like four participants, of which two were salaried. Uh, they had ridiculous budgets for expenses and travel. Um, and most of the work they did were, I mean, all the work they did was not with abused kids. Little of it, of it was with abusive parents. And most of it was essentially public service announcements and glorifying their own work. And if you look at the surveys that were happening at the time for this group, then you can see that the majority of the parents who joined Parents Anonymous did not abuse their kids. And even those who identified as abusing their kids said that they verbally abused their kids. Now, you know, I'm a parent myself. Parenting is hard. It really is. And we want to be the best parents we can. And a support group that tells you, you know, it's fine to be angry at your kid. You know, this is how you, you deal with these feelings. That's great. But that has absolutely zero to do with child abuse and with child abuse policymaking. And the problem is it became all a spectrum of kind of white parenting woes rather than an intervention to reach out to children who really were uh, in need of uh, assistance. Um, to back up a little bit, what's CAPTA? It's, uh, CAPTA is a Child Abuse and Prevention Treatment Act that passed in early 1974. Um, in the 60s, uh, after we defined child abuse as a medical syndrome, states scrambled to pass laws requiring reporting of child abuse. And by 1967, all states had a child abuse law on the books, but these laws differed. And CAPTA set a federal standard for what child abuse laws should look like in different states. Uh, and they used a carrot of funding to make sure that states complied with these federal guidelines. It is still in place today. Uh, and one of its most recent and, in my mind, destructive um, things that CAPTA has done is to, to expand definitions of maternal drug abuse during pregnancy as something that is governed under laws of child abuse. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, before, before, before we deal with that, because the book has a very powerful ending that um, kind of incorporates this, like some of the some of the fallout from these policies. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about some of the researchers who emph emphasized more social determinants of health rather than these individual focused, you know, individual psychological interventions um, to, for preventing child abuse. So what kinds of programs and policies were they recommending? Um, and then why was their advocacy ultimately unsuccessful and the more kind of parents anonymous uh, viewpoint one out. Sure. Um, so, you know, by the seventies, there was little appetite for programs that sounded community based or anti-poverty, you know, after the backlash to the, um, great society programs and poverty, the war on poverty, then people weren't really interested in being caught up in programs that targeted poverty. Um, and really most of the researchers who looked at child abuse found that, poverty and racism were risk factors and that these should be addressed. But, you know, certainly you can't say we're going to sit here and do nothing until we fix poverty. So they did have ideas for providing services for families. And in New York, they had a program that ran that was a respite program that families who were struggling with childcare could bring their kids and get a break and, and kind of get their lives together uh, for a while and have their kids return to them. So there were different models to think about it, but none of them were as compelling as the idea that all we have to do is encourage individual parents to take responsibility and to change their behavior, which is, you know, in its, in its essence, uh, an American narrative of redemption, of personal responsibility. And in the 70s, that reverberated. Also, it's way cheaper to fund parent groups than to fund programs that really provide resources and support to struggling families. So there were interventions in the 70s that were designed to support families in different ways, but they remained underfunded and unpopular and did not really, um, did not really result in the same kind of nationwide excitement and, and beliefs as the Parents Anonymous model. Yeah, it's also, you know, it was a time where, when we, when a lot of children were removed from their families and there was a lot of attention on the plight of Native American children who were removed at astronomical rates from their homes um, for concerns for abuse and neglect, often having to do with cultural differences as well as alcohol use uh, in Native families. And so really the programs that were designed to support families and, and, and preserve the integrity of families and offer services uh, didn't really get a lot of attention. And instead, what happens, you write that in the 60s and 70s, like 
the physician child encounter comes to be seen as this perfect opportunity for intervention, the opportunity to detect abuse that may or that seems like it may be hidden. Um, and so, you know, how how does this how does this happen? And then how do we come to invest in mandatory reporting over the provision of, of child or welfare or social services? Well, in medicine, we always have this idea that early detection is better. Uh, and it's not always true. I mean, sometimes early detection of cancer just causes you to detect earlier cancer rather than, you know, extend lives or offer treatment. So we don't, it's not always true that early detection is better, but we certainly believe that as a public health uh, approach. And detecting became the new, you know, the new, um, uh, oh, sorry. So, so detection became the new emphasis in trying to weed out the children who were not reported and, and the children trying to make sure that they're all getting the focus on detection, which it really stems from a public health approach, became the new way to think about child abuse. And it's true that a lot of kids who were being abused at their home weren't being called into attention. And in fact, some children were hurt and some children died. But the answer to that is not mass reporting of children for being you know, poor. poor. But it did set the stage for this new idea that you know we have to report suspicion and that uh, and, uh, referral to child protective services is always a first step. It's um, what a uh, child abuse doctor at the time called the abusification of child welfare services. So that in order to get any kind of service from child welfare by the mid seventies, you had to have a report filed. So you couldn't just offer services like home visits or you know food or something that was valuable. You had to have a child abuse report first and raise concern and only then could you have the service as a response so it really um kind of inserted a element of surveillance and investigation into the um, provision of services and by the 70s and 80s there was a shift in focus from the provision of services in child welfare to essentially becoming an agency of investigation uh of investigation and ultimately coercive interventions like requiring certain interventions and ultimately removal of children. One thing that I really like about this book um, is that in contrast to, to some, you know, history of, of medicine books, and I think this must be because of, of your training and policy, um, you do not shy away from talking about um, making judgments about which of these policies were more and less effective. Um, what evidence is there for the effectiveness of mandatory reporting. Yeah, that's something that really struck me when I was researching this book, is how little evidence there was for anything that was being done. Um, and just policy was made in the complete absence of evidence. Uh, and then it, you know, and, and then it perpetuated. And I show in the book, you know, one area they were talking about, you know, how, what kind of statutes should we have for reporting? And one question that came up would be, was, should we have harsh punishments for failure to report? And there really was no evidence to support this. And a bunch of people raised a concern that this would create too much reporting and people would feel compelled to report by, you know, and that they would risk being punished if they didn't report, and that this might have um, unintended consequences. And ultimately, the group that was looking at these um, suggestions came out and said, you know, there was a big debate about should we have uh, penalties or not, and these were both sides, and we decided to include the penalties because there is no evidence that they don't work. And I was like, what? You don't need evidence they don't work. You need evidence they do work. And there was absolutely no evidence that they worked. And in fact, there was evidence that showed, you know, there was there were studies that showed why do people fail to report? And there were a whole bunch of different reasons, such as, you know, fail to recognize abuse. You thought you could handle it yourself. You didn't trust the child welfare agencies. It's you don't want to get involved. But no, nowhere was it the penalties were too low. And that's never been an issue. And yet in the 70s, they decided to expand penalties for not reporting. And the thing that blew my mind even more is that ever since then, at any juncture, we expand penalties. And we did that in the aftermath of the Jerry Sandusky. And we talked about it in the aftermath of the Larry Nassar cases, which are two famous cases in which individuals of power in powerful positions abused children, other people knew, and nobody reported. And if you think about it, you know, what evidence do we have that the reason people don't report these horrible things is because the penalties are not high enough? None. We just want a way to retroactively punish people that we think failed in what we want them to do, which is to report. So 
looking at how policies were made, I was really struck by this absolute lack of evidence, which marked these policies from the very beginning and persists to this day. In some places, we have a little bit more evidence today, but um, not much. And a lot of the policies we have are created in a vacuum of evidence. And with my policy training and my medical training, I'm able to read, you know, the studies and say, you know, this was, this seemed to be effective, but you were only measuring four people at a time or, you know, so the the data was very, very poor. Uh, and the studies were cited without any uh, reflection or criticism and, and perpetuated as if it's, as if it's a robust study, when in fact it's an anecdotal study on a small sample or when the study didn't actually show what it said to said to be showing. So I think that's one thing in which my training in health policy is useful, that I can ask, wait, what are they relying on? And then I can evaluate and say, oh, this this really didn't meet any standard, not just by today's standard, but by the existing standards of, of um, scientific studies at the time. And then you go on to, to talk really in, um, in compelling detail about the kind of ef- the, the effects that these policies had on particularly on communities of color. Um, so I wondered if, if we could talk a little bit about that for a minute. So um, the, you discuss the relationship between child welfare policies and the growth of transracial adoption, and then kind of compare um, what the fallout of these policies in, in Native American communities and then in African American communities um, tell us a little bit about um, how these communities disproportionately affected people of color. Yeah, so these policies really targeted poor families and families of color. So there was a lot more reporting, and perhaps unsurprisingly, more reports were filed about Black children and also um, Latina families. Uh, and these reports, you know, once a report was filed, it was more likely to be substantiated if it was about a Black family. Once a child was, was removed from the home, the child was more likely to stay in substitute care and foster care or in an institution, less likely to be reunited. And so we created the system in which, you know, we started worrying about child abuse. We passed laws to increase reporting. We created a ton of reports. And as a result, we removed a ton of kids. And by the late 70s, we had so many children outside their homes that it became suddenly a concern about all these poor children in foster care. Um, And that's really the backdrop for the passage of the um, Adoption and Child Welfare Act that passes in 1980. And so that that act was designed to do two things. it, It was designed to reduce the number of children and foster care in two ways. One is to provide ser- services to keep children at home, so the permanency planning. And sorry, one, I'll backtrack. So the this act the that passed in 1980 was designed to reduce the number of children in foster care. And it did in two ways. One was to provide more services to keep children in their homes. And second was to allow children to be adopted into families for a permanent, um, for a permanent home or permanent solution. But the funding and the planning for these um, family preservation programs was very, very poor. So the unintended consequence of this act that passed to reduce children in foster care was that these family preservation programs failed or were portrayed as failing. And instead, it set public opinion towards viewing adoption as the response. So we go from worrying about kids being abused, removing kids from their home, worrying about kids being in foster care, and ultimately pushing towards adopting kids. And in that way, this whole child welfare system becomes a way in which we procure children from poor families to place into middle-class homes. Uh, And, you know, the money follows a child. The families who provide foster care are paid to provide foster care. I'm not saying that they're doing this for the money or that they're, you know, that they're getting rich off this. I mean, many foster parents are very dedicated to the well-being of children. But if this money could be reinvested in communities instead of following the child to a foster care home, then children could, you know, successfully remain in their homes and have their needs tended to and families could thrive. Instead, the children and the money are taken out of the communities. And ultimately, that ends with the um, Adoption Safe Families Act, which shortens the timeline for adoption and termination of parental rights. And families experience the ultimate destruction of their family integrity, the termination of parental rights and placement of children. Uh, and adoptive families uh, permanently. So it's it's a it's essentially 
Oh, go ahead. I, well, I was going to ask if there's any evidence for this, right? That students do student, I mean, do, do, do children do better in, did the children do better in foster families or adoptive families? So there's a lot of debate about foster care, whether it's beneficial or not. Um, and you could find, um, you could find serious scholars who have opinions on both ends. Some view foster care as a service, quote unquote, that that children enjoy and helps children thrive. Uh, that might be the case, and there. Are, I don't want to discredit the accounts of children who will tell you that they they did personally thrive in foster care. But as a whole, removing children from their homes is detrimental to their families and to their communities. And in many studies, it shows that it has long term detrimental effects on kids too. Um, so I'm going to be careful here because there's different studies that have shown different effects on children. But certainly when you remove a child from their home, that negatively impacts the home and the community. Now, what happens when a kid is adopted? Well, the answer is we have no clue. So once a child is adopted, there's no longer any follow-up and there's no longer any data. So a child might be removed from an abusive home or not abusive home, a poor home that's struggling, gone to foster care and ultimately adopted. And we won't know if that child is being abused. And there are sometimes cases of, with, with children are abused in adoptive homes and the family of origin, the biological family doesn't even know about this. There was a terrible case a, a year or two ago about two women who drove a uh, SUV off a cliff in California and killed um, a, a number of their adoptive children. Uh, and it turned out that there, were, there had been a lot of complaints and child abuse reports about this family. And that these children had been placed with this family, black children placed with two white mothers. Um, and they had been placed with this family when they had been removed from their biological families. And the biological parents were not even informed that these kids were killed by their adoptive parents. So I'm not going to you know, say that adoption is bad or that adoptive parents are abusive and so on. But the truth is, we don't know if adoption results in better outcomes because because of privacy reasons, we stop following the child once the child is a place in adoption. So the book concludes um, with two sort of moral panics um, in the 1980s that both, um, you know, have have consequences that extend into the present day. Um, and one is a panic over child sexual abuse. And the other one is over crack cocaine use. Um, and you talk, you write about how these panics contribute to a two-tier system of aid, um, one tier for, for white children and families and one tier for, tier for black children and families. Can you tell us a little bit about um, these, uh, these issues and how they relate to each other? Sure. Yeah. So in the 80s, we saw this moral panic that people were, you know, were worried that their kids were being abused uh, and in daycares and this idea of satanic ritual abuse in which children were, were subjected to terrible forms of torture by the people who are supposed to watch them in daycares. And we still have people who are serving time in prison to this day from these perceptions. And Honestly, this is quite sim similar to the QAnon conspiracies about, um, you know, a cabal of child abusers and so on. There is no evidence that this happened. Uh, the evidence that was manufactured was faulty. Uh, and there was a lot of continu um, there was a lot of uh, con continuities between the Parents Anonymous people in the 70s and the people who were involved in the satanic uh, daycare panic in the 80s. Uh, and the truth is that, you know, they were working in with the absolute absence of data of absence of evidence. And probably the only abuse that happened was the um, relentless investigations that these children um, underwent, including uh, with anatomical dolls, anatomically correct dolls, which there was no evidence to support that use. And which, you know, this today they say, oh, show me on the doll where that person hurt you, where they were supposed to show on the doll and play with the doll. And essentially anything the child did was taken as evidence of abuse. And if you read the transcripts of the interviews, you know, by today's standards, it's, it's certainly uh, appalling. We Today, the, you know, the scientific consensus is that there was no satanic ritual abuse of children in the 80s. And that while, you know, child sexual abuse is a real problem, um, the panic created did little to address that problem and diverted attention from children who were actually 
uh, in need. We know that you know sexual abuse happens most commonly in homes by people we know, and it's not a stranger problem that is happened with you know with abduction and ritual abuse and so on. And at the same time, there was concerns about mothers who were using drugs while pregnant, uh, and part of that was a backlash uh, of the. Um, after you know uh, essentially a fetal rights kind of moment backlash to abortion rights trying to regulate how mothers um how pregnant mothers behaved while carrying uh, the fetus and trying to to charge women particularly poor women of color with child abuse if um if they were uh suspected of using drugs while pregnant and even if there was no damage or harm caused to the child, or even if a woman underwent a, unfortunately, a miscarriage and there was no evidence that it was caused by drug use, women were charged with a variety of different um, kind of legal acrobatics to charge them with different forms of child abuse. And women uh, women did serve time for for these um, kind of offenses. Uh, and so, you know, there were at the same time, you know, at the same time, there, were, there was a focus on, you know, on treating the child, the perceived sexual abuse of uh, you know, middle class white families versus punishing black and um, and brown bodies, mothers who were using drugs and who were seen to be um, who were seen to be abusing their kids. Uh, and it, a lot of this is politics of um, uh, essentially a, a backlash politics and, and trying to uh, to respond to to change in society in which mothers go out to work, children are placed in daycares. And, you know, what is the worst thing that can happen? And then you absolutely imagine the worst and, and you run with it. Uh, uh, and it's kind of similar to what we see today with the QAnon thing, you know, protect the children. Of course, we want to protect the children or save the children. But there's, but the, um, the people who are so intent on, on crying to protect the children are supporting policies that in fact hurt children in so many ways. So it's it's an interesting moment here in the '80s that I think is informative for today as we deal with these questions of you know how do we even how do we even address these bizarre conspiracies and claims about hurt about harm to children in our society today when we can't even um, agree on one concept of reality or, or truth. So it's two tiers, but like neither of the tiers seem very effective. Am I am I wrong? <laughs> well, I mean, in, yeah. some, in some ways, you know, calling attention to sexual abuse is valuable, so that more children would come, you know, would be identified and so on. So it might be the silver lining of that. But yeah, no, it was terrible. I mean, the se- child sexual abuse panic of the eighties was absolutely terrible. People went to jail. People lost their jobs. Moms were petrified that their kids were being abused because experts told them that they were abused, even when they weren't. It, it, it ruined families. It, it you know, it's, it ruined careers. It it was absolutely terrible. And the same thing goes for women who use drugs instead of offering them treatment. We think about addiction as a, as a disease, as a a relapsing, remitting disorder that needs to be treated. But, you know, especially for poor women who are in state insurance, there are almost no, no places that take pregnant mothers and treat them and that accept, accept Medicaid. And that's a problem to this day. So instead of offering them treatment, we're offering them punishment and even, you know, prison. So, and moms did go to prison and what, you know, what worse outcome for a child would be to lose their mother to prison rather than caring for this child. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. Women who are separate breastfeeding mothers who are separate from their children. It's just, um, it's the heartbreak is, is so intense and in particular, so unnecessary, uh, instead of thinking about policies that actually help families and children. Uh, and that's really a, a recurring theme, you know, in our country where we are, our, our policies are so anti-child. Um, we, you know, c- kids don't have access to services, don't have access to food, don't have access to health insurance. Uh, but then we punish their parents for not being able to access the things that kids need in order to thrive. So, and then, you know, what happens in the end, a child is separated from their parent, a parent is punished, a parent goes to jail. None of this is good for families. So a lot of historians of med I won't say a lot, some historians of medicine, we like to, um, to hold back about making recommendations based on the history that we study, and especially making um, really explicit policy prescriptions. But I'm going to ask you anyway, what kind of child welfare policies would you recommend? What, you know, what, what do you think, um, what would be effective and what role should health professionals play in these policies? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So, you know, we have to fix the child welfare system and the, 
it's clear that we need to be focusing, and child welfare focus needs to be focusing on provision of services rather than investigation. Child welfare caseworkers are not trained detectives. They're not police people. They don't have the resources that the police has. They shouldn't be charged with investigations. They should be providing services. And that's kind of what, what shapes everything I think about child welfare. It should be in the business of services and not investigations. Um, and after I published the book, or I finished the book, I started um, working with some colleagues, including Alan Detloff at the University of Houston, who is calling for an abolition of child welfare. Uh, and that's kind of where my head is at now. I'm really excited about this framework in which we, you know, we imagine what would a world look like without child welfare services. And then you might ask, you know, but who's going to take care of these children? Who's going to protect them? And I'll say, well, child welfare isn't doing that well anyway. You know, we're not identifying the children at need of intervention, that, and and then we're not providing the services that are uh, that families need. So the child welfare is services are already failing. They're not meaning what they should be doing. So to ask how we're going to do without them, you know, pretty easily. They've, they're not doing a good job. And then how do we rethink this? So we ask, you know, how do we imagine a world in which we don't need an investigative service to look at child welfare? How do we imagine a world in which we provide families with what they need to thrive? But then you say, oh, well, but that's, you know, right now there's a kid being abused. What do I do about that? And I guess that's where I end up in my book, you know? So if a child is being abused, that's a crime. And that should be reported to the police. We should remove investigative powers from child welfare agencies. They should be providing child welfare services. Uh, if you're worried about a crime, there should be a, a specific investigative body uh, within the police, which is monitored for disproportionality, uh, which will address investigations. But we shouldn't have the same people who provide services to be the ones who remove children from their homes. Uh, and then you ask, you know, why don't poor people want to engage in services? Well, because you're threatening them with removing their kids. Or if you bring them to the house, they'll start looking through you know, your cupboards and reporting you for lacking what they think is needed in the home. So you can't have service provision with the same uh, uh, coercive aspect of investigation and punishment. So I think we should separate them and have child welfare focus on child welfare. And if we need a investigative and, co and coercive um, intervention, then we should uh, delegate that to a body that does that. And that, you know, should be some police-like agency. But we shouldn't have this it coming from the same place. Uh, we shouldn't be expecting to be helping people under the uh, threat of child removal. You know, how people are going to engage in services if everybody was providing these services as a mandated reporter and or is able to remove children from their homes. So child welfare needs to be completely reformed. My personal um, preferred policy is to you know, think about this as, let's think about a world in which we don't actually need these services. What would it take to help families you know, f thrive and prosper? Uh, but before we can you know, fix that, we should at least take these few steps in which we refocus child welfare on child welfare. So there's a lot of a lot of policy work, a lot of advocacy work to be done on this is issue. Um, it's clear after reading your book. Um, are you? Do you have another big book project going on right now, or are you just kind of do, do doing the the policy advocacy thing? What's What's next for you? Well, uh, I mean, I had a new project in mind that I was in the archives working on, and that was March twelfth when I was sitting in the archives uh -huh. uh, and the next day uh, everything closed down and uh, pandemic and COVID and so on. And so, you know, our life has changed in so many ways. And, and for me, my, um, my focus has shifted a lot. Uh, I, I work as a hospitalist. I take care of COVID patients during a surge here at our hospital. So I've been very busy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of us doctors have had to learn about caring for COVID patients. So it's not just a time in the hospital, it's a time you, you learn this new skill. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about how health policy shapes our COVID response or our lack thereof, you know, our health policy lessons from this pandemic have been pretty shocking. I've been also engaged with colleagues from child welfare thinking about how to use insights from my historical work to uh, advocate for change. Uh, ultimately, I hope to go back to this project that I st was hoping to start a year ago, which looks at um, different models of uh, of insurance and and why they, you know, group practices and, and versus fee for service and why there was such opposition. Uh, more kind of a traditional study in, in health policy making 
but uh, that is on the back burner right now as uh, as I continue to work during this pandemic and um, and continue to be active in advocating for child welfare reform. Understandably so. Well, keep keep me posted. I'm and I look forward to hearing more presentations about that work as it progresses. Thank you. And um, Michal, I, I just can't thank you enough for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you.